Welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute-related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 59, Flute Studio Highlights with Dr. Cobus de Troyes. Today's gold sponsor is brought to you by the Interactive Flute Retreat. Join Project Trio at the 5th Interactive Flute Retreat, an all-inclusive event on the private shores of South Haven, Michigan, August 16th through the 19th, 2019. The retreat is a unique opportunity to continue learning and growing in a peaceful environment with world-class instructors. Walk away rejuvenated, improve your skills, and form memories in a picturesque location. Registration is now open. Please visit interactiveflutretreat.com. Welcome everyone to another Flute 360 podcast episode. Today I am with Kobus and we are going to talk about some flute studio highlights. And this is part of series 11 and specifically we're going to talk about the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and doubling studio size, talking about castrate recording project, Western Massachusetts Flute Day, and hashtag we bring flowers. Kobus is a distinguished flutist and teacher, and he's a Haynes artist and ambassador clinician. He is also the assistant flute professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Welcome, Kobus. Thank you so much, Heidi. Thank yeah. you for hosting me here in your beautiful home. Oh, thank you. So when I tell guests like yourself that these in-person talks are very exciting for me because you're here in the yeah. flesh and blood <laughs> and the phone conversations are extremely fun, but I think being in person is that much more special. Yeah. So thanks I'm glad for, we could work it out while I was in town. Yeah. So thanks for reaching out and it was very kind of you to offer your time and I'm excited to pick your brain. Sure. Sure. <laughs> so... First, let's before we get into all those different topics, let's talk about your residency here in Texas. What are you up to? Yeah, so I'm um, I'm giving two master classes. Uh, yesterday I was at Tarleton State University, and then um, today I'm going up to the University of North Texas for a master class, and then I do a little 15 minute solo flute piece recital. And as you mentioned in the intro, that is something I really enjoy um, working with the Haynes Company is they um, is very generous in sponsoring um, and reaching out to the flute community wherever their artists go. And so they just started this campaign. Um, I think it's hashtag Haynes Gives Back, mm. um, which I find really and it's sort of very closely aligned to my personal project. But it's just I think it's a wonderful that what they're doing is just sort of getting knowledge out into into the flute community. And I think Ambassador Clinician, I don't think any other flute company is really doing that, um, where there's a real focus on flute teaching, which mm. I think is so important. I think we, in general, we tend to focus on all the great performances and great repertoire, and of course we should, but I also think it's wonderful if anybody can benefit from from good flute teaching. Yeah. Um, and as you know, your teacher, Lisa Garner Santa, is yes. also a um, Haynes artist and ambassador clinician. And I know she does some good work for them too. Yeah. yeah. She's always, the three years I was at Texas Tech, she would give these Haynes clinics. Yeah. And she was always busy with that. And it's exciting and very inspiring to see a flute company that is extremely um, supportive. Yeah, and their, invested in the community, which yeah. I think is really great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they have these great posts I see on social media with students being super involved and showcasing uh, success stories. Yeah. And it's very, like I said, inspiring to see that they are extremely supportive. Yeah. So that's yeah. cool. And then, of course, being in Texas, they're doing that um, is it the Texas All-Star Flute Competition. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> which I'm sure everybody is very well aware of here in Texas. Yeah. First semester, it's <laughs> like those A2s, that's all they really, you know, harp on. And then it's like, oh, you know, but yeah. So anyways, it's it's a thing here in Texas for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. So later today you go to UNT. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm excited for that. 
That's good. Are you teaching the students through Sunberg Studio or McNutt or Clardy's? Uh, Sunberg. Sunberg, okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Will you be giving a recital too? Um, so I'm going to do, it, I have sort of a two hour block. And so then I'm going to start the class by performing three solo pieces. So I'll be play, playing um, Robert Aitken Icicle, which is a great um, mm. introduction to extended techniques for people that that are sort of fearful of extended techniques. And what he did is he wrote two lines. So the top line is what it should sound like and the bottom line is what you're playing. Because I think very often when people are new to extended techniques, they're not really sure if they're making the correct sound. Mm. You know. So what's great about Robert Aitken's Icicle is he gives you all the instructions and then you can look at the top line and kind of see if you're doing it correctly, which I think takes some of the fear out of it. And then I'm playing Debussy Syrinx and then um, Ian Clark's Zoom Tube, which is sort of my little party trick, you know. <laughs> it's a <laughs> fun always, piece. It's always good to have those party tricks yeah, up absolutely. your sleeve ready absolutely. to go. I'm getting to the point where I'm like, I wonder how many times can I still perform this? Because <laughs> 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 I've played it all over, you know. It's like, yeah. Yeah, that's fun though. Oh man, I so wish I could go up there. If I didn't have uh, teaching this evening, yeah. I would be, you know following you up to Denton, but I know it'll be wonderful. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so let's get into the different things that you would like to share with the flute community today. Sure. So would you like to talk about um, your flute studio at UMass and yeah. recruiting and doubling your flute studio size? Because I know that's that's impressive. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm just in love with my job at UMass Amherst. It is, it's sort of, if I could write my dream job description, that would be it, you know. So the studio consists of between 15 to 18 students. And we have a master's degree program, but we do not have a DMA. So I have right now about three master's students, and then the rest are all undergrads, about 11. And... What I'm loving about that job is it really gives me the opportunity to build community in a very creative and interesting way. Because where we're located, even though Massachusetts is the size of a postage stamp, where we're located, the western part of the, of the state, we're sort of, you know, 20 minutes to the Vermont border and, and 40 minutes to the New Hampshire border. And um, all these sort of states that you, that you think of as being a little bit more rural – Right. And of course, there's lots of flute things going on in Boston and New York. And even though that's only a two hour drive, um, when I started there, I realized that um, there's lots of activity flute wise going on in upstate New York and Vermont and New Hampshire. But lots of people just don't like going to the big bad city, <laughs> you oh, know, like huh. finding the parking and like <laughs> paying, you know, twenty five dollars for a lunch, you know. Okay. Um, and so I sort of, I saw this gap where, so when I lived in Colorado, that's where I did all my graduate work, I was heavily involved with the Colorado Flute Association. And I always just loved, I really felt like I found my group of people there, you know? And so I kind of wanted to recreate something like that. And so the first year... Jake Fritkus was our guest artist, who I know you've had on the show before, too. Yeah. And then the second year, we had Christina Jennings. And then last year, I sort of thought, well, I'm going to spice it up a little bit. And I, um, I've, after the fact, I thought it was crazy. But I started... So first year is one guest artist. And then last year I had six, Whoa. which I know is quite a jump. And my department chair kind of looked at me like I was crazy when she reluctantly gave me some money. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, so last year I, I kind of chose a theme and I went with where flute and science interact. Mm. And so I had, we're very fortunate um, to have Katie Coleman live in Western Massachusetts, oh. who is a bona fide astronaut and she lived on the space station uh, for six months. Wow. And so if you YouTube uh, Jethro Tull and Katie Coleman, mm. um, there's this great duet they play, her from the International Space Station and Jethro Tull from earth when was it was it the some convention i want to say north carolina there she was sort of a powell featured guest because she took a powell flute up into space yes um, i remember that yeah and so she did a wonderful talk to us on sort of the parallels between performance anxiety and mu and she understands those because she is a musician she plays with with lots of um sort of indie bands and things like that Very so she cool. really understands those parallels between how to perform under pressure and mm. and being a performing musician so that was a great 
chat. And then the other in- really interesting guest artist that we had was Juliana Nickel, mm-hmm. who is busy with, she's the first person in the world. Um, she had focal dystonia in, I think, her left arm. Um, and she's on a medical trial right now where they, they implanted a node of some sort in um, her middle brain. It's very intense and wow. very, um, and sort of her journey with that and sort of the struggles of um, not being able to perform for a while and then slowly coming back. And now she can play again, but then trusting her, that ability that was established before focal dystonia. And, and then we also had the, the most fun trio of ladies, um, Jill Falber, Claudia Anderson, um, Angelita Floyd. Yes. There we go. <laughs> I think she's retiring this year. Yes, she is retiring yeah. this year. Yes. So they um, they did the piece they also performed at the NFA convention, okay. which is that wins for change. For So it was great because my my flute choir at the University of Massachusetts got to play on the final concert. And, mm. um, and it was just it, as great as the first two years were. Um, this final year just felt so great because it, it just sort of, I mean, I more than doubled it, you know, um, and the people really, really are responding to it to the point where, because I always have it the first weekend in December, mm. and um, there's two local flute choirs that's moving their Christmas concert because they want to come to Western Flute Mass or Western Massachusetts Flute Day every year. Yeah, so it's just really, it's growing slowly and steadily, but it just feels great sort of getting to know I almost, I, if I say like the flute player is out in the woods, it's literally out in the woods because <laughs> <laughs> it's a very rural state, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, but it just, it's just a great opportunity to, because um, I really believe that that's why we do music is to build community around and build friendship around music, right? I mean, what else yeah. is chamber music? Yeah. You know? It's an intimate conversation e- among friends. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And some of my best friends are people that I'm in a duo with or yeah. people that I play music with regularly. Yeah. You know? Oh, that's wonderful. And congratulations to you. That's a huge uh, feat that you've accomplished in the sense of bringing that community towards your campus and six artists. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact that people are starting to... Uh, sketch out that weekend and they don't want to miss it exactly that's showing yeah. that there's a lot of success there yeah so now i'm a little bit under pressure for next year because i have no idea what to do <laughs> so if anybody has any ideas out there for me i'm all ears because i i'm not really not sure where to go next year but i'm, I'm thinking don't about do it seven <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah when, when i was president of tfs in 2012 we had three guest artists plus the Myrna Brown winner. Yeah. As you know, because you've been a Myrna Brown winner. Yeah. And we had Carol Winsons, David Weiss, and um, Mark Sparks. And then the Myrna Brown winner that year was Shauna K. Thompson. So she, well, the last year she was the winner, but then came back as the guest artist. Yeah. But that was more than enough. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. And so kudos to you, man. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> well, and to me, the interesting thing was it wasn't necessarily the actual flute day. It was the logistics of getting everybody from the airport to the university yes. and getting everybody back and making sure everybody's fed and making sure everybody has a place to sleep. That that was actually the more stressful part than the actual day. The day was great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually one time, and it was the year before 2011 when I was vice president, Jonathan Keeble was a guest artist for TFS. And it was just that, the logistics of picking up them from the airport yeah. and taking them to the campus and whatnot. I got into the UNT campus, and so heads up since you're going there <laughs> soon. <laughs> there's this awful driveway that goes up, and there's these brick walls on either side. Well, I was bad to even go up because I thought, this is narrow. How am I going to get out of here? Backed up in my brand new car, all scuffed up. Oh, no. Go and pick him up. I'm like in tears. He's like, Okay, all right. You know, what am I getting into? But every year since I've seen him, Jonathan is like, oh, Hyundai Elantra, you ruined your car for me. <laughs> so those logistics are a real Pay thing. Paybacks are double, you should sell him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, shoot. But um, that's so exciting. And um, so by having this outreach and having this UMass day, you're seeing your numbers for the actual students coming to the campus, like grown just because of the awareness of Yeah, so it's interesting. Studio? I um, There are two of members of my studio now that I did meet at Western Massachusetts Flute Day. Okay. But I mean, who, who, like recruitment is such an elusive topic, mm. right? I mean, right. who knows what works and what doesn't? We all have our beliefs, what we think we're doing that's working. And mm. But to me, I think... It, like, like kind of to come back with, I think, 
For me, I think my recruitment is successful because I'm consistently sending out a message with all my projects of inclusion, right? Mm. And this may sound a little bit severe, but almost sort of of safety, right? I think okay. I think in a, in in a university environment, especially a, comp- a competitive university environment, mm-hmm. I think that it can very easily become cutthroat and nasty and almost psychologically damaging, right? Yes, definitely. Um, and so we, uh, we, uh, the university made this flyer for the flute studio, and that's what I start the pamphlet with. It's just here we celebrate community first. And whatever community might mean, it might mean the 15 members of your studio. It mm. might mean the larger flute community. It might mm. mean your role in the music building as a whole, right? Mm. Or your role in the ensemble or... But just really um, treat each other as you're going through the program and as especially your fellow studio members, how that those are friendships that you're going to form for life. Yep. Right? Yep. I mean, and that's the network you're going to draw from for a very long time to come. Mm -hmm. And so the very first studio class, we have a very, very um, in-depth and and sort of honest conversation about certain feelings that might arise when the concerto competition comes around and when and how you can deal with that and how I can help navigating through that. But that this is a safe space and that this is a place where you're really here to grow and be supportive of other people, mm. right? And the and that's the thing. I speak to lots of people that's graduated school. Yeah. And, you know, the story is very familiar. It's sort of, well, I'm not finding work. I'm not gigging. I'm not doing all those things. And then we sort of, I prod a little bit with questions and I go, well, so are you part of a local, you know, flute association? Or are you mm. playing in a local flute choir? Are you, mm. and the answers to all those all those things are no, 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 right? And I do. we live in a world where social media is so active. And of course, you have to have a social media presence, right? Yeah. But I think I don't think a social media presence is important or it can replace right. personal relationships, yep, exactly. right? It adds to. Um, I don't think it's it's a replacement for, for somebody really, you know, just trusting you mm-hmm. when they first meet you. There's a great article. So... Um, Amy Cuddy, who teaches at Harvard, yeah. she did all this research on basically um, when somebody meets you for the first time, mm. they instinctively ask, can I trust this person and can I respect this person, wow. right? Within the first two seconds. And yep. if if the answers to those two fundamental questions are no, like the instinctual reaction to that person is no, then you're going to have a much harder time forming a bond with that person or forming a friendship with that person. Wow. Right? Yeah. And so that's kind of where, yes, we, of course, talk about a lot about flute and scales and stuff and Alain Gobert. But um, I think, like, the underlying impetus behind it all is just is just um, being a supportive musician. Yeah. You know? And what I hear from that is, you know, just my talk with the students at Texas Women's University, just such a smart group of kids they literally, you know, they talk about this with Pam Youngblood, their yeah. food studio professor, and just these topics that you're mentioning, just being very open that, you know, here are these feelings and finding your spot. And so one thing I found was what I'm hearing, the parallels between your, um, you know, what you're sharing right now is everybody has a place within this music community yeah. and helping, you know, having the professors help find your place and your role, whether it's music community or more of a smaller niche like the flute community, we all have a role. Yeah. And we may not be like a solo performer extraordinaire like Emmanuel Pahud, but what's my role within this network? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, and to come back to your recruitment question, to me, that is how I answer the recruitment question is um, building a culture, Mm -hmm. you know, because I can mention any... Um, well-known flute teacher mm-hmm. in the U.S. and instinctively any flute player that's semi-plugged in would sort of know the reputation of that teacher, right? Yes. This teacher is known for X, Y, and Z. This teacher is known for this, right? Yeah. Um, and so I feel like it's the, like now that I've gone through my fourth round of auditions at UMass, um, I'm definitely seeing sort of a change of individual that's hmm. coming to to audition, um, which is really exciting for me. Yeah. Um, and of course, I want to say yes to them all, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, very yeah. cool. Today's sponsor is brought to you by J&K Productions. Did you know that not only are they a production company for podcasts, but they are a recording company for musicians. 
any musical recording needs that you may have, J&K Productions can fulfill that need. They have all the necessary equipment and expertise to record your next flute recording for college or graduate auditions, competitions, summer festivals, or a flute album. J&K Productions can record any setup imaginable from solo flute, small chamber, flute and piano, and much more. Consider J&K Productions for your next recording project. Contact them at jkproductions.media. Going back to what you're saying, too, with inclusion and, and all of that, too, and you're noticing, you know, like you said, these people coming in, so you're you're getting this reputation of, oh, that's Cobus and yeah. Dr. Dutois, you know, and I've heard this about him. And so that's, you know, what you said earlier, you're not quite sure what does really work. But if you're seeing these positive, you know, changes or whatnot, then it's just, um, you know, it's just supporting the fact that your notion and your um, mission and all of this is is going going in the right way. Yeah, yeah. Um no, and of course I want my students to be the best flute players they absolutely can. Of course, you know? yeah. Because um, you're preparing them for a yeah, music job, whatever exactly. that may look like. Yeah, but there's just so much more to building a career in music than just yeah. being able to play really fast and accurately and in tune. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So that's one huge project that you've been busy with with UMass Flute Day. Tell me about your recording project. Sure, yeah. So I play in the Antero Winds, which is a professional woodwind quintet. And we played this the woodwind quintet by Jacques Casteret. And I just fell in love with this man's music. Um, and always in the back of my mind, I had this idea that I would want to record mm -hmm. all of this music. He passed away in 2014, unfortunately, which... Mm -hmm. I would have loved to meet him in person. But I would go to the convention. I would just see flute piece after flute piece after flute, flute piece that you can buy. Um, but there's no re available recordings of it, hmm. right? Um, and so when I, when I accepted my position at the University of Massachusetts, I thought, well, okay, I have to, you know, to get tenure, um, I have to show some substantial creative work. Hmm. And immediately this sort of file I put back in the back of my, my mind came came rushing back to me. And fortunately, the university has great recording grants that you can apply for. Nice. And so it just kind of all worked out. And so it's 14 pieces all in total, and it ranges from flute and harp, flute and guitar. Um, there's a quintet that in string trio, flute and, and um, harp. Um, all the way to there's this piece for three trumpets, three flutes, two pianos and two violins. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like he's, but his style is always um, a little bit tongue in the cheek. Okay. Um, actually, a lot of people might actually know La Belle Epoque, which is this piccolo and piano piece. And it's sort of this spin on, on all these little operatic themes. And it's all very very challenging from a technical standpoint which was also something that interested me because I wanted to be a better flute player by the end of this right right and so I actually we submitted the the final edits for the second cd last week and there's a third cd so it all sort of fit onto three cds um, for Naxos and even that was an interesting project getting because I knew the only label that would really it would make sense for would be Naxos because they're the only label that sort of publishes these or and distributes the complete oeuvre by um, different composers. Mm. So just getting Naxos to bite, if you would, um, that in itself was a very, <laughs> very interesting process yeah. and sort of a lesson in perseverance mm. and asking. And if you get a no, asking another person. And if you get a no, like asking another person in the organization <laughs> until you get a yes, you know. Yeah. Um, so, but it's it's really been an interesting project for me because it's when it's all said and done, it's basically going to be three years of my life, right? Wow. And so it's very interesting going through these edits because it's pieces that are recorded two years ago and it's pieces that are recorded four months ago, right? Wow. So it's a it's almost like a um, like a time capsule of, oh, I don't play like that anymore. You know, like, oh, I did, oh, I don't do that thing anymore, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so it's a really fascinating project for me too and, and learning how to record and not be afraid of the microphone. Yeah. You know, that is the that is the other amazing thing. And and 
it's not that the playing is necessarily for the earlier recordings. It's all very acceptable and I'm very proud of it, but I can hear a distinct difference almost in the later recordings where there's not a fear there's not a fear of making a mistake in front of the microphone anymore, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because if you're forced to be in the studio every six months for four days at a time, you know, it just you you kind of lose that. You just go, here's another one. Let's go. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. So it's it's been a really, really fascinating project to work on. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm probably not going to record something for a w quite a while <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, after. But yeah, so the first CD is coming out in October 2019. OK. Um, and. Yeah, I'm just really thrilled for people to to learn or to get to know this man's music because it's very, he sort of, um, he taught at the Paris Conservatory. Mm. Um, CLs, which is a piece for flute and piano, was prescribed for the Premier Prix competition in 1985. Oh, okay. Um, so he, I mean, the, the composer has substance, you know, just oh, for yeah. some other reason. He's just never made it to popularity, wow. you know. Um and then there's two works that he mentions on his website that he says is unpublished and unfinished. And I got in touch after months of looking and looking. I got in touch um, with his widow and mm. she went through all these papers and she sent me the handwritten, unedited scores of these two pieces. So on the third CD, um, there is there's two works that has never seeing the light of day which wow. is really exciting and that was also interesting sort of almost being the editor and going like because you can see some of it is sort of he's still trying to make up his mind and then but mm. fight, like he repeats the same thing later and then you have to make the call oh yeah this is a dominant seventh arpeggio he wants here you know it's oh, that yeah. was also almost playing half editor half performer that was also a very interesting 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 process yeah oh, cool yeah and i have to learn the final recording date is may 6 so i have to learn how to play contrabass flute very effectively for that <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's, you know, you just have, and what I'm hearing is all of these different hats that you have to wear, you know, being an editor and deciding, yeah. okay, that's going to be a blah, blah, blah chord and yeah. a, a new instrumentation. And I don't know, just the production of the CD and things like that. Yeah. It's just, it's keeping you on your toes. And as you know, with your podcast. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. And just what you said, I got so excited. I don't, the listeners can't see this, but I was kind of giddy in my chair <laughs> is when you said not being afraid of the microphone, Yeah. you know, over lunch. And I was telling you how I went to maybe propose this. Your uh, suggestion was fantastic. Proposing something for NFA about the parallels of podcasting and being a musician. One of them, the, one of the parallels is the microphone. Yeah. And I have noticed a huge change in my recording process as a flutist because of talking into a microphone. Yeah. You're in front of this microphone, you know, two, three times a week. It becomes second nature. At first, like episode one, you can hear my voice. I'm like, uh, hi, I'm <laughs> hi, <-bee." laughs> And now it's just, yeah. you can't shut me up. But, um, <laughs> you know, with this past, I've been recording for some competitions and some works that I just want to hear improvement in my sound and just kind of check in and, and see where I am as a player. But even Eric's noticed that he's like, you approach that microphone completely different. Yeah. He's like, you are not shaking in your boots anymore. It's just very natural. And so I got giddy in my chair because when you said, Oh, I've noticed that the microphone is just this thing and I'm not afraid of it anymore. Yeah. There is that is that really is a thing. Absolutely. You know? you know, and that's the thing I think students, particularly at the graduate level, for instance, that they forget is that the only difference between them and a really seasoned professional is experience. That's yep. all it is, right? Yeah. I mean the first time that whoever your your flute God is, right? <laughs> I mean, that person also had that experience of stepping into the front of the microphone for the first time. You know, mm -hmm. it's just you just have to expose yourself and expose yourself to lots of new ideas and things. And yeah. that's what I love about actually the creative art field is that you by doing new and interesting things, all of a sudden you things fall into your lap and your career to take these or your career takes this unexpected turn, which you would never think would happen. And then all of a sudden you're super happy doing it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's an, <laughs> That's it's, where the magic happens. Absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. So thank you for sharing those wonderful um, updates and um, insights with your recording project. If you would like to, let's move on to another project. Man, you're <laughs> a busy guy. <laughs> Your hashtag, We Bring Flowers? Yes. What's that about? Sure. So in 2015, um, after the Paris attacks, mm -hmm. 
which now seems like such a long time ago. But it was really sort of an event that shook an entire city. And it was almost, it was one of the sort of almost very first ones to happen. And I had a really tough time dealing with that emotionally in terms because I had two young children at that point and just sort of like what, you know, how do you raise children in a world that's sort of filled with, with the evil, if you, if you yeah. want to phrase it that way, right? Um, or people that can make better choices. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was this beautiful, beautiful interview, um, a French journalist was interviewing a toddler boy and his father. And the toddler boy said um, that he's understandably very scared and that there's Paris is full of bad guys and that they have to leave the city. Mm. And as they were interviewing this little boy, um, the father said, well, do you see these people bringing flowers and, and candles as vigils for the victims? Um, that is more powerful than anything violent could ever be. Wow. Um, and so I just found that so powerful, like taking something like a flower and giving it so much more power mm-hmm. um, that really resonated with me. And so I called the project We Bring Flowers um, based on that. And so the idea was to commission five composers to write music that directly revolts against or directly confronts societal violence um, in a way. Mm-hmm. And I didn't give them any restrictions. All it had to be was a, it had to have piano and it had to have the flute or the extended family of flute. Okay. All the way from piccolo to bass flute. And that was it. That's that's the only parameters I gave them. And mm-hmm. what what came out of it was just so incredible because I my idea behind the project was kind of to see almost heal a little bit myself, but also to see how other people in the arts deals with these sort of events and how they process it, right? Mm. And so it was almost a sort of looking through societal violence in a, through a compositional lens, okay. if you would. And the pieces that came out of it has just been so, so beautiful. Mm. One of, I mean, all of them are my favorite, but I started with Amanda Harburg's Court Dances. And that, each piece was funded in a different way. The Court Dances was a consortium commission. So I ended up with... Because again, building community, I wanted mm. I wanted somebody else to sort of that's struggling with this, kind of give them an outlet to feel like I'm also contributing in a positive way um, to the world. And so I ended up with, I think at the end, 54 flutists that contributed to this commission, all the way from China. There's a flutist in Brazil. It was incredible. So that was the big, the big piece. And then she kind of used um, racquetball. Mm. exercise sort of as a means to clear her head and and process right Mm. and so this piece is very rhythmic and very high energy and very fast paced which is great because you would think sort of such a such a deep topic would would sort of result in five really slow moving (laughs) meditative music but every piece was so distinctively different and then there's another one by nathan hall a room of quiet which is what he did is he um took at the United Nations headquarters, Dach Hammerschild, who was the second secretary general of the United Nations, he um, designed a meditation room mm. um, at the headquarters. And it's only, it's a block, a center block in the middle with a one single light source. And so he used this mm. meditation room um, as inspiration for this project. And so this piece is great because it, I have to narrate, I have to sing. I play piccolo, alto, and regular flute. The pianist has to narrate and sing. Um, it's just 12 minute, really dramatic, beautiful, beautiful work. And the text is basically the pamphlet you would get when you were to visit this meditation room hmm. at the United Nations. And and the idea behind the text is that it's you're sort of in this room of peace that can transcend anywhere out into the world, anywhere else out into the world. Um, and so sort of the culmination of this um, is my duo partner, Doreen Lee and I were performing this at the Australian Flute Festival. We've performed the entire program in bits and pieces, you know, um, all over the place. But then the final performance for a while of this project is um, at the Australian Flute Festival in July, which I'm really, really thrilled about. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... Those of you who know Kovis will know that he is such a humble guy, but the teacher in me is screaming out to all students out there, for you or anyone, and myself included, I'm guilty of this, and we say, there's not enough time in the day, I and we make up a million excuses. 
<laughs> Sorry, you can't because <laughs> listen. I mean, we just talked about like four projects that Cobus is, you know, um, working with and um, organizing and in charge, and it's it's so inspirational to hear everything that you are contributing to our community and in such a creative way and with such heart and such compassion. And so I thank you for that. But so the teacher in me is just like, you know, this is it students. Like, <laughs> cause I hear all these students, you know, every week and I'm sure you hear the same. Well, I didn't have time. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. What's the famous quote where they say, um, you know, Benjamin Franklin and uh, Helen Keller, they had the same 24 hours in the day. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, you're a shining example of that. Uh, But I wanted to to throw that out there. Thanks. Um, I appreciate it. (laughs) Yeah. And you're raising two boys. Yeah. Two great boys. Yeah. Well, I should also say I have an amazing wife. That, like, (laughs) takes a lot of pressure off of me. So that's good. What a good husband. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No, she's um, amazing in the pictures. I kind of snoop on your social media page. She seems so lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah we're to... high school sweethearts. Yeah. Are you? We started dating in 11th grade. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Eric and I are uh, college sweethearts. Nice. 8 a.m. music theory class. We'll... <laughs> <laughs> we'll solidify a relationship for life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, shoot. Are there any other um, studio accomplishments or um, things that are happening with your students, like projects they are involved with that you want to share? Anything? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The and that, I mean, and that is the goal, right? Yeah. Is that mm-hmm. through your example that you inspire something even greater than what you're doing, right? Yeah. Um, and so... I just had a student finish a BAMF residency, the winter residencies, and it's basically she's doing a project on about body positivity mm. in the classical music industry. Um, Interesting. Yeah, huh. and how she sort of, the project started out with collaborating with a singer who's got an incredible voice, but that was always told, like, you're not the right body type for this role, wow. right? And so... She did this whole successful Kickstarter fundraising campaign, and she just finished her her um, her Emily Kaplan's her name, and she um, mm-hmm. yeah. So there's really that's what really excites me actually is that wow. that students are sort of thinking about these ideas, and I had a senior music ed major just do a recital and. On the recital, he played Irish flute and he played traverso and he played right. I mean, it's just so I'm I really am inspired by by the gumption that my students possess. Wow. You know, that's kind of actually what feeds all of this creative energy in a way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But just that rippling effect, yeah. you know, like you showing by example and then your students being inspired and they go out into their parts of the world. That's the hope. You know, yeah. and that's when you get those like goosebumps and yeah. think, wow, like I'm making an impact and yeah. I'm seeing well, them, and them see, make an impact. And I'm a firm believer in that we should start measuring success in a different way and I don't even know if success is fulfillment maybe is a better word right because I think we tend to think of it as very tangible things in terms of well I need to win this job I need to make this amount of money I need to make you know where I honestly just think if you are are doing things artistically that makes you feel fulfilled and fed in a certain way good things will come your way I right? See. Yeah. And because of that, you will find your musical home. Right? I see. And sure. I see so many people just pushing in a certain direction just for the sake of, of getting a stable income. And of course, I, I get the yeah. flip side of the coin too. You know, I mean, yeah. like, we all have to pay rent, we all have to eat, and it's scary if that is a concern every month. So I, I do understand that flip side of the coin too. But right. I just really think if you are passionate about every single project that you do, mm-hmm. you will attract a, the same type of people, right? And by sure. attracting that that network of people, good things will come because of that, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just, I I speak to my students a lot about that because I, I just think it's sort of, you really have to ask yourself, what, what do I want out of my flute playing? And not sort of what is society telling me I should be doing with my flute playing right now? Oh, yeah, for sure. Even like graduating in May, thinking, yeah. oh, I don't have the title that I want or yeah. I think I want. You, like, there's so many, uh, there's so much negativity yeah. that comes with that because there's a lot of judgment. Yeah. And it's like, but wait a second, I'm I'm contributing in this way and I'm feeling like, I love the word you just used, fulfilled. Yeah. I'm 
being fulfilled in this way, it's like, who's to say? But I think, I know your students are completely blessed to have you as their teacher because oh, you. for them to hear that at an early age is so imperative. Yeah. It's so imperative. I wish I would have heard that younger because yeah. when that you know, season of your life and you don't meet that expectation or that title or whatever, you start bashing on yourself. But, you know, just, I don't know, having that seed planted in them earlier yeah. than later yeah. is so good. Well, and if I look, if I, we just sort of zone in a little bit on college teaching jobs, right? The, mm-hmm. um, at the University of Massachusetts, they call it potential for tenure. And what that means in the, in the search committees, it, it's basically mm-hmm. they look at the past seven years and then they look, well, if this individual continues on the same trajectory, will they receive tenure, right? Oh. And I think so many people think like, oh, I need to get a job and then I'll, I'll start getting creative. You know yeah. what I mean? And that's, <laughs> exactly. and that's what I think. It's just if you're creative and doing things that fulfill you, mm-hmm. that is going to make for a very interesting portfolio mm-hmm. that is going to entice a reader when you apply for something. Yeah, you know exactly. And yeah. we, I mean, we live in a time where there's so many grants that you can apply for. Mm-hmm. The um, finding money is never easy, but it's becoming easier. <laughs> you yeah. know, there are you can do a lot yourself nowadays. Yeah, and I don't think they'll mind because it was a huge um, success. But Elizabeth McNutt just won a grant. Yeah, and it was through you know our collaboration with Texas Food Society, and yeah. it was really cool for me to see that I'm the treasurer this year. And just to see it from that end, like, oh, wow, as an artist, she got real creative with how yeah. to collaborate with a society in the area and how they, how we as TFS, the organization and the artists collaborated to make this work for her. And it's like, wow, huh, I didn't, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know. It just opens up this whole, like, box of possibilities. Well, and also, if you're sitting on a panel, you know, the final three, it, it Somebody has to get the grant, right? Yeah. But you don't know if you were one vote away from yep. that grant. And I think lots of people apply for something once and it doesn't work out. And then they sort of move on to something else. I'm like, just reapply. You know, you never know who's going <laughs> to apply the following year. You know, yeah. just be, just keep on pushing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't know what's going on on the other end of that exactly. the panel, the, the back stage you yes. know, area. Yeah. Cool. So is there anything that, I don't know, any idea or thought or anything else you want to share and and use this time oh, to? Oh, sure. Yeah. So I, um, if there is a, so my next project, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I live for projects, if you can tell. Um, <laughs> now that some of them are wrapping up, my next project um, is titled Vocabulary of Emotion. And so what I'm doing is I am doing micro commissions for composers. So I, so every, um, I don't want any pieces that's longer than 30 seconds. And the idea is that you take, I want to use trigger words that happen in relationships. I'm sure all of us that's been in relationships, if your spouse or your significant other says a certain word, Mm -hmm. that sort of triggers a whole flush of emotions, right? (laughs) And you're smiling because I know what you're, I can tell you not have one, right? Yes. So So the idea here is that to really explore um, through a musical lens, how how that sort of reaction looks like in relationships, right? Um, so if there's any budding composers out there that is interested, because um, the idea is that sort of that this is full recital of just 30 second um, emotional, almost like one perfumes, if you would. Mm. Um, and so if there's any budding composers out there, wow. please reach out to me because I would love to get to know more composers. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Excellent. It kind of, maybe that'll be a series, you know, next December. And I say December because this past December was interviews with composers. Oh, yeah. And so just, um, it's still composers. And that was a popular uh, series. So I, I want to do it again. But then something very specific saying 30 second compositions. That's completely yeah. different than a concerto or a sonata. Exactly. Well, I, I just want the essence of something right it's just sort of like just as powerful as a trigger word can be sure somebody that's been f- through trauma or and yeah. also that these things can that these little vignettes can um almost serve as a sort of therapy for somebody wow Runei, you know yeah um and so yeah it's it's just i love this idea of a micro commission because wow. because usually sort of when you commission composers, it's always between eight and twelve minutes, and you you know it's always about the timing, sure. right? Yeah. And then they sort of 
plan their composition around, well, I'm going to develop the theme for this much because I only have this much time left, you know? Right. But if you don't really have a have time to develop anything, if it's just a musical statement, right. what would that look like? So that's what I'm really interested in with this Vocabulary of Emotion project. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's what I learned from Christopher Caliendo. He said the first question he asks at a conversation where he meets with the, the film score people. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to not sound very official, but the first question is, how long? Yeah. You know, and for a film, that makes sense yeah. because you have images and the plot and the story and whatnot, but um, to not have... To be kind of freed and just, the like you said, the little snippets. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know. Just what can come out of that. Yeah. And I just imagine, I don't know, Kobus, you're so creative. Like, I'm just imagining, <laughs> like, when you go to bed, you sleep with, like, box of, <laughs> like, box of crayons. <laughs> or to, to, like, for all these colors, just to, like, seep into your brain. The, like, for me, my creative space is the hot tub. I can just sit <laughs> and daydream in the hot tub for forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After a long practice day, I just sit in the warm water and just let my thoughts go. <laughs> okay. So that's your source of inspiration. Yes. Do you, is there, I'm just curious, is it, like... Do these thoughts come to you like while you're driving from like, I don't know, school to school or event or is it playing with your children? Is it or yeah. is it kind of sporadic just because I'm, I'm getting giddy here because I mean, all these things are just I don't know if they're so creative and not just creative where, you know, you, you think, oh, you know, this this or that. But like it's well thought out, too. Yeah. And so, I mean, I guess my main piece of advice would be not to be afraid to use people as soundboards okay because you can the thing is if you the moment you verbalize an idea mm -hmm. you get a sense of this has traction or not right okay. you, you, when you i kind of almost use my my inner emotions as a guide if i explain something to somebody and i kind of go like ah, i don't know about this right if i'm not fully convinced then i just let the idea go okay um, but also if you're fully convinced by an idea and somebody that you trust, right? Mm -hmm. And you tell them about it. And you can see there's like the subtle hints of sort of confusion, like the question mark above their forehead or, <laughs> right? And if there's sort of a, then it's either like, oh yeah, this is a good idea or let's can it or let's develop it in this way or, the, right? Um, but to come back to how I come up with it, I just think constantly, yeah. right? I just, yeah. I just, I think it like creativity is a muscle, Sure. I really do. Yeah. And it's like the more, you know, the more you can say like, wouldn't it be cool if, mm. right? Like that sort of that daydreaming aspect of it, okay. right? Um, and I like I see that in my children, right? If you read mm. a book, you can see they, they're making up that picture in their, in their mind's eye as you read, right? Mm. And so it's sort of this, just the more you can daydream and the more you can, you know, think. And then... Also, of course, you might have a great idea, but you also need to know about the scaling of it, right? Yeah. It's like, do I have the resources? Do I know the right people? Or if not, who do I reach out to? And how do I, right? And like discuss the Red Recording Project. I was sitting mm -hmm. on that idea for a good seven years before the opportunity presented itself um, to actually make it a reality, mm. right? Yeah. Um, and so... I think that's the un another thing that's very difficult, but to learn is just patience, yeah. you know? <laughs> it's just because you have a great idea doesn't mean it's the right time, mm -hmm. you sure. know? Sure, right. Um, and you you see this often where you where people, you know, artists or that, that term sort of, they were ahead of their time, <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, yeah. And, that, and th we do need the, the boundary pushers too, right? But then mm -hmm. sometimes it's just not the right time and you're not going to get traction, so you have to wait a little bit. Yeah. You know? Very cool. And I think just hearing your process is um, good for all of us, no matter what stage we are in, but especially students. Again, I just kind of go back to that just because um, I see my, myself first and foremost as an, as an educator. Yeah. And I love to help students connect those dots quicker. Absolutely. So that way they can have that light bulb moment sooner. Yeah. I don't know, just because then more doors are opened. Yeah. So just to kind of get some insight on your process and how you approach it, I think is is really good for students yeah. to, to hear and to yeah. consider. Yeah, and so, I mean, my, like through Weaving Flowers and Vocabulary of Emotion, like I'm really interested in this link of psychology and music, right? Or Love sort it. of, yeah, I mean, that sort of naturally my thoughts gravitate towards, you know? Yeah. yeah. And for some people it might be tech for some, you know, technology. And for some people, just like follow your heart, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> 
sorry. I every time I look over, I promise I'm not being rude. Oh, you're it's fine. It's literally just like for the <laughs> listeners out there. You when we set up like you know 40 minutes ago, my husband, the audio engineer, just walked out and Kobe <laughs> saw sweat. <laughs> Coming down my face like he's leaving me alone with the equipment. And so every now and then I'm looking at the computer screen just making sure the sound waves are still going. Because I don't have my backup here. And it's like, so I, he probably figures at episode 59. Yeah. I probably should. I shouldn't, shouldn't He's cutting myself. the cord. <laughs> yeah. Just kicking you out of the nest. Yeah. Here you go. Oh, shoot. Well, congratulations on all these projects and your accomplishments. And I can't wait to see how the miniatures yeah. uh, come out. And um, I can't wait to hear your Naxos um, recordings. Oh, thank and you. that's so exciting. Yeah. yeah. And um, good luck today going up to Denton. You should be fine. Yes. <laughs> it's a good time of day where you're not going to hit rush hour traffic. I need to work on the silent N because I want to say Denton, but it's not oh. Denton. It's De- Denton. Denton. I can't do it. <laughs> I'm not a Texan, although I keep saying y'all and I'm like, oh, the Chicago in me is not, yeah. it's not happy with it. But um, yeah, Den- Denton. <laughs> Thank you for carving time out of your schedule. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and coming yeah. out this way. And I wish you all the success that's coming your way. And I hope to see you at the next flute event, whether it's NFA or... Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been to Salt Lake City. Have you? No, but I'm really excited to go. I think it's a beautiful... I've hear, I heard it's a beautiful city. Yeah. Yeah, I want to go visit all the landmarks. and. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I've heard it's gorgeous. Hmm. Well, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Today's sponsor is brought to you by J&K Productions. Did you know that not only are they a production company for podcasts, but they are a recording company for musicians? Any musical recording needs that you may have, J&K Productions can fulfill that need. They have all the necessary equipment and expertise to record your next flute recording for college or graduate auditions, competitions, summer festivals, or a flute album. J&K Productions can record any setup imaginable from solo flute, small chamber, flute and piano, and much more. Consider J&K Productions for your next recording project. Contact them at jkproductions.media Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. For more information, please visit HeidiKBegay.com And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review in the iTunes store. Let's talk about flute!